Hey guys, Chris here with The Good Old Gamer, and welcome to part three of our CPU Showdown series. So today, we're going to be looking at the big dog, the 6700K from Intel, and we're going to pit it up against the other benchmarks that we did in the previous CPU Showdown series. Now, the point of this series is to show not so much what your CPU is limited to now. This is really meant for people that are looking to either build a new system or upgrade their system and kind of give you an idea of how games are going to perform in the future, or at least the near future, you know, as best as we can do with what we have here today. So we're going to go ahead and look at the same benchmarks we did in our CPU Showdown uh, Part 2, and if you guys haven't checked that video out or Part 1, please check those two videos out. Links will be in the description below, and I'll go ahead and put links in the video as well. Unlike the previous videos, I'm going to go ahead and kind of streamline our benchmarks a little bit, on part two, it got a little convoluted, and a lot of you guys asked me to just kind of simplify things, and make it a little bit easier to see what the heck's actually going on. So I went ahead and just ran the benchmarks using the GTX 1070 only, and instead of using different configurations, all the CPUs are set to 4.4 gigahertz, and the different RAM speeds will be notated in each individual benchmark. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in here. We're going to start off with The Witcher 3. Starting off with average frame rates, as you can see, the 6700K is in the lead. It is definitely the fastest by far. And going to the 6700K, which, by the way, to emulate 6700K performance, all we did was disable hyper-threading. Although the 6700K has a little bit more L3 cache, this shouldn't make a huge difference in performance, meaning that this should be within a few percentage points of what the 6700K would be. Okay, so back to the averages. Uh, like I said, the 6700K is clearly in the lead, followed by the 6600K. Right below that, you'll notice the 4690K is significantly slower. This is probably due to the fact that the 6700K and 6600K are using DDR4 memory at 3200 MHz. Looking at the 2600K, you see it jumps far ahead of the 4690K at 4.4 GHz, up to 105 frames per second, and of course the older 2500K is lagging behind the rest. So clearly Witcher 3 seriously benefits from the hyper-threading on the Core i7s, as the 2600K is nearly as fast as the brand new 6600K. Now if we look at the minimums, the story's pretty similar. The 6700K has the clear lead, 6600K is behind that by a good bit. The 4690K and 2500K are well behind those two, but the 2600K is pretty close to the 6600K, and this is using much slower memory, which we know Witcher 3 thrives on fast RAM. So this really shows that the hyper-threading performance really helps out a lot on Witcher 3. Now moving on to Crisis 3, it's kind of a similar story here, guys. We have the 6600K clearly in the lead on both minimum and average frame rates, followed by the 6600K. The 4690K is far behind. The 2600K is ahead of the 4690K once again, and the 2500K is lagging behind. The big thing on these two benchmarks, both Witcher 3 and Crisis 3, is the 6600K will hit a minimum frame rate of over 100 frames per second. Which, as you know, this is a high FPS channel. We're trying to achieve 100 frames per second as a minimum. And with the 6700K and the GTX 1070, that's possible on these two games for the first time. We haven't come anywhere near these performance levels until the 6700K. All right, finishing up our DirectX 11 benchmarks, we go ahead and check out Batman Arkham Knight. And this is a little bit of a different story. If you look at the average frame rates, just going from architectures, it just goes straight down the line. So it looks like the IPC gains really are more beneficial than the hyper-threading on Arkham Knight, although the 2600K is still a little bit faster than the 2500K, just like the 6700K is a little bit faster than the uh, 6600K. But it's nothing too major until you look at the minimum frame rates. And this is really where the 6700K shines. Once again, keeping us above that magical 100 frames per second mark. And all the other CPUs are kind of floating around in the middle there, uh, except for the 2500K. I ran that through a couple of times. It, with the benchmark, there is kind of a stutter point at the beginning. So I'm assuming the 2500K just might not be able to 
ramp up fast enough to, to stay up there. But for the most part, on average, it's really not too much further behind the rest of the CPUs. Okay, guys, we're going to start off our DirectX 12 benchmarks with Ashes of the Singularity. Of course, this is the big one that everybody uses, as it was pretty much the first benchmark out there. Okay, looking at the 6700K and the 6600K, they're identical. They've tied. The 4690K is just a sliver above the 2600K, and then the 2500K is far behind uh, the, the rest of them. The 6700K and 6600K have clearly hit a GPU limitation, as hyperthreading does help a decent bit, as you can notice with the 2600K versus the 2500K. Since we see no gains on the 6600K, that means 67 frames per second is the maximum that the GTX 1070 is able to push out on Ashes of the Singularity. But we do notice that the benefit in DirectX 12 does seem to favor the instructions per clock, as the 4690K is actually faster than the 2600K in this particular benchmark. Jumping on over to Gears of War Ultimate Edition, our next DirectX 12 benchmark, we see the 6700K keeping its lead, followed by the 6600K and then the 4690K. The 2600K takes a decent hit on here, and we originally thought that was due to the fact that perhaps it didn't like hyper-threading all that much, but the 6700K doesn't have that particular problem. Perhaps on newer architectures, the hyper-threading is a little bit more advanced and utilized a little bit better in at least this particular title, as the 2500K is performing a little bit faster than the 2600K. But overall, even though these charts look very big, we're talking about only a few frames per second difference, and this is on average, so it's not that big of a gap, even though the chart certainly makes it look that way. Alrighty guys, now we're going to shift on over to Rise of the Tomb Raider. As you can see, the 6700K takes the lead on the average, uh, followed by the 6600K. The 4690K is actually behind both the 2600K and the uh, 2500K. Even though that's pretty much within margin of error, it would seem that the slower DDR3 is probably more the factor there as clearly the instructions per clock doesn't really affect anything as the 4690K is a little bit lower, the GPU is identical, the only real difference between the 6700K and the 2600K is the RAM speed and the IPC. Since we can rule out IPC, clearly faster RAM here is what's allowing the Skylake processors to jump forward. Now moving on to the minimum frames per second, this is where things seem to make more sense. The 6700K has the clear lead, followed by the 6600K. Then you have the 4690K, which is significantly higher than both of the older Sandy Bridge processors. And now, finally, I'm going to wrap this up with the most well-optimized game that there is out there, and you can now see why. All CPUs used averaged 168 frames per second. This is what we want to see. This is what games should be looking like. When you eliminate CPU bottlenecks, it will run the same on all platforms. What this means is you're able to just upgrade your graphics card to net more performance. You don't have to worry about the rest of your system. This is really nice if you're one of those people that like to keep your system for more than two or three years and just want to upgrade your graphics card every year or two. However, Doom is kind of the outlier. Id Software is fantastic at optimizing their engines and their games, and more than likely this will not be the, the most common outcome, but we can hope as Vulkan and DirectX 12 are still in their infancy. Hopefully developers will learn, hey, we need to actually optimize our games, and then that will bring down our CPU overhead, and then everybody can enjoy these games with the fastest GPU that they want to without having to invest in a new processor every year or two. Well, alrighty guys, I'm going to keep this one a little bit shorter than the rest. The overall conclusion is for high frame rate gaming at 1080p, which if you're trying to do high frame rate gaming at 1440p, you can do that. Same thing applies for you guys too, except you're going to need much more powerful graphics cards to hit these same frame rates. Regardless, the 6700K is clearly the winner. The 6600K, although is a decent contender, your minimum frame rates are generally far behind that of the 6700K, and in reality, really aren't that much far ahead of the 2600K. 
So if you're running an older i7, such as 2600K, 2700K, 3770K, 4770K, or a 4790K, you guys should be just fine. Uh, if you're running older i5s like a 2500K or a 3570K, and you're trying to run high frames per second, the upside is you don't really have to go out and buy a whole new platform, just upgrade and invest into an i7 processor, and that should help you out. Now, if you're building a new system, and you want to go ahead and just start fresh and you want something that's going to last longer, go ahead and do yourself a favor. Spend the extra 100 bucks and get yourself a Core i7. This is going to help out your minimum frame rate significantly. What this does is it allows the game to run more smoothly and you just don't notice any judder. Whereas with i5s, I can see kind of a little hiccup here and there. And although it's a little distracting, it's not a major point. But to some people out there, that's a big deal. Well, alrighty, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here. If you guys like this kind of video, please hit that like button. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and share with friends. That really does help us out, helps us get the word out. And we hope to just inform people on their purchasing decisions, give them as much information as possible. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you haven't checked out part one or two of our CPU showdown series, please check those out here, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.